Let's talk Afghanistan. Come on, Tech. Of course. <laughs> man, good morning, brother. How you doing? Look at tech, I really believe that you're a low key Taliban, man. <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Put on the turban right now, B. Hold on. Yo, Kid Vicious, I tried to bring you in because we could talk later, whatever. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking apologize and shit, nigga. I ain't, I ain't never did shit to you, bro. First of all, we can talk about fall it. back, fall back, <laughs> and uh, let's talk Afghanistan for real. Um, I let me let me do my let me finish my little diatribe, yeah. my little my little preamble, right? So yeah. I did this whole room on Clubhouse. This was months ago, right? Months and months ago, uh, specifically about Afghanistan, right? Right. And I went and did a whole deep dive on the history of Afghanistan, right? Sure. Starting from the you know, where it really got the title for the graveyard of empires. Um, but more specifically, the question of why did Russia go into Afghanistan? Mm -hmm. Right? And a lot of people think, well, I don't say a lot of people, but if you don't know, you just know Russians went in there and start tearing up shit, but you don't know why they went in. Right. It was like they did, uh, what's the piece? Like people think it was like a religious thing, right? Like they went in to do like some religious oppression. But it's like that's that's that wasn't happened. That didn't happen at all, right? Like that that came like later. That came later. Yeah, that came the, later. The instance was their homeboy that they put in power got his Doctor shit, the right? Mm -hmm. So Russia came in, was like, "Yo, we don't want this other dude because he he doesn't have the sympathies with Russia." So they did the basic kind of hegemonic power play of supporting the homie, right? And then everything cascades from that, right? Blowing up little kids, all that other crazy shit. There's one thing to add too. That yeah, yeah. The, the New York Times and several other articles when they were discussing Afghanistan about a decade ago um, talked about how they had uncovered documents from the Soviet era in Afghanistan that were very mirrored to what American companies were talking about now. And that is the massive amount of natural resources that are mm -hmm. in Afghanistan, not just emeralds and natural gas, but you're talking about nickel, lithium. You're talking about all of these other things that actually make this computer and the cell phone that were on functional. And I think that that's one thing that we know that the Russians were very aware of at a very mm. early stage in time. The other thing that's important to note for your followers is that Afghanistan was an epicenter of Sufism for, de for centuries. And I mm. think when you talk about the, 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 the Islamic world, you talk about there being always two camps now, and that's ignorant because people only see Shia and Sunni and they discount Sufism, whereas in Afghanistan, Sufism was extremely popular. And as a matter of fact, it was the most popular um, form of Islam or sect of Islam that existed there. A very spiritual nature, people that believed in not the, the, the necessity to, to cover, to show the, 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 the dedication to Allah, although I leave that to the interpretation of the public, but rather to say that their purpose is, if you would like to wear hijab, you're totally welcome to. If you don't, you won't be chastised in this society. If you want to wear bell bottoms, sure. The question is, are you a good Muslim? Do you take mm -hmm. care of your neighbor? Do mm -hmm. you feed the poor? Do you make salat? Do you do these things? Do you give jizak? Do you do things that are positive for the community? Are you an upstanding member? Not, not simply just giving the virtue signaling that we have now with Christianity in this country. So I think that was interesting. Uh, look. My time there was in, in 2009, so obviously a lot of things have changed since then. Um, I remember the people that were there at the time were more aggressive towards the American invasion than they said they had been towards the Russian invasion. And I'm not saying physically, but mentally. They said the Americans are coming in here promising freedom, whereas the Russians came in here telling us we're going to have order, right? We're going to get back to order. Whereas the Americans promised that we're going to have this free and quote unquote liberal society, but then didn't bother asking the people what kind of society they wanted. And at the same time, help themselves to the natural resources. And also you and I both know, brother, Afghanistan is incredibly well situated in the world. You know, mm. we were basically knocking on China's front door, like, hey, we're right here. We're right next door. Hey, Pakistan, we made your man Musharraf step down. Why? Mm. Because Bush, technically scared him. He said, yo, take off your uniform. Where else do you hear that? Where else do you see that? 
from somebody. And then we look at the Obama administration that I know you caught a lot of flack for saying that they were terrorists in, in the mainstream media. But realistically speaking, looking at Afghanistan and looking at the rest of the region, Mr. Obama simply completed what we both know as the Bush doctrine, which mm. is overthrow of countries that are not aligned to the hegemonic view of the United States. So in other words, that's what frustrates me when I hear people talk about communism or, or fascism or anything. And I say, the United States doesn't care if you're a communist nation or you're a fascist nation. It cares that you're in its camp. Are you in our camp? So it's not that we're opposed to communism. No, we're opposed to people that say no to us. You know, and that seems to be the backdrop for, for what I saw there. But I also saw things that were revolutionary to some people. I saw girls going to school for the first time in 30 years. That was something that people thought was a very big deal because during the, the, the reign of the king that preceded Dr. Najib, that was actually something that was taking place at the time. You know, mm. a, a progressive, I won't say progressive movement, but a movement towards making sure that women gained access to the same amount of education, um, so to speak, that men did to put them in the, in the light of those careers. Mm. So, but y'all don't know, Tech actually has a, had built a, did you built a school in Afghanistan? An orphanage and a school. It originally was an orphanage and a school. And then obviously when the kids got older and they graduated, uh, they got to be 17, 18. Uh, many of them, since there weren't, there are very limited spaces at, at Kabul University and other places, the majority of them went to like trade schools and they found good jobs. And I spoke to... I spoke to uh, some of them like via like FaceTime and then um, the people that were, were had taken over the setup of everything once we did the fundraising, omade.org um, basically had told me that then the school obviously because of like zoning issues and other stuff had to be shut down. But I do remember that when I went out there, we literally did build a bed for the children, like we had to go to the local mosque to get their approval. We had to prove, hey, listen, we're not CIA. Like I have no, I have no skin in the, the political game for you guys to sit here. But at the same time, we we did want to help. We want to show you that everybody in America is not some imperious, imperialist lunatic. We don't want to come here and take over. We literally just saw what our government did. We thought that was wrong. And as a hip hop community, we raised this 150,000, 120,000, and then put it into creating the, 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 making sure that we got an empty, hollowed out building, fixing it, pulling the nails and the glass at anything. We literally brought appliances in there, anything, a stove, you know what I mean? A, a heating system. Um, it definitely was a little bit complicated to deal with the consulate and get out there because mm. once I'm there, I literally go to Dubai and I see like riches because you can get through two, pretty much two, three ways, through Iran, through Dubai at the time, or through Turkey, right, through Istanbul. And realistically, we were just like, all right, let's try Dubai. I've never been there. I just want to see it. And I went from seeing like extreme riches. And then on the other end, when I arrive in Afghanistan, I see extreme poverty. But mm -hmm. I noticed certain things about the moment I touched down. Everybody judges you by your shoes. And that says a lot about you. And if you wear boots, they assume you're a soldier. If you're wearing their, their style of shoes, they assume you're an Afghan. If you're wearing really nice shoes, they're like, oh, politician, the most dangerous one, because you're coming here with the, with the honey tongue to tell people what they want to hear, but you're not actually going to do anything for them. So they're used to this, you know what I mean? In the way that Americans, and we see not just, you know, black and Latino Americans, but white Americans now are just like, oh, this government is so oppressive. And in Afghanistan, they're just like, well, all governments are oppressive. What did you expect? They're all going to be like this. Mm -hmm. A very cynical view, but at the same time, a very realistic view of what society actually means, that laws are only enforced by force. If there is no force, then there's no such thing as a law. If you can't enforce a law, then a law doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. if you tell people something and they don't listen to you, you know, and then there's a lot of dark things that I saw in Afghanistan. The, the remnant of a pay-for-play system with the CIA where they were basically buying people um, from a general called Dostadaram that was a break off from the Northern Alliance. And this man was selling people who were opposed to the American invasion as if they were Taliban, as if they were Al-Qaeda fighters. 
and he got money per head that he delivered to the CIA. Many of these people were put into Guantanamo Bay and whatnot, but a lot of them, Lupe, they weren't Taliban. That's mm. the thing that I have to make clear. Like, I know you made a joke earlier about that me and Taliban, but the thing is this, what makes you Taliban? What does that actually mean? Like the people that were opposed to the American invasion, they were considered Taliban. Many of the people that are opposed to America's presence they have no no loyalty to the Taliban or or to the previous structure that exists there. They mm. simply do not want the United States in their country. And for that, they say that they're Taliban. And if I look at the demographic, people forget Persians are not Arabs, right? Mm. They might have the same religion, but he, here's an interesting thing. Afghans are not Arabs either. And when I was mm. in Afghanistan, they were actually a little bit xenophobic. Like I, my beard was longer than it was now. I was wearing you know, all the, 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 the shalwar kameez, everything. And the dude put an AK-47 on me and was like, uh, Arabistan, are you from Arabistan? I'm like, no, dude, I'm not Arabian. He's like, you're not, you're not, and the dude, the other interpreter came over. He goes, you're from Saudi, right? I said, no, I'm not from Saudi. I'm from New York, homie. You've I, been had, they, I had the New York fitted. I had the fitted. And he was like, I had the fitted, yeah, and I was like, I, I brought it out. And he was with like coalition guards. So two American troops come over. And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's he, he's one of us. And the guy had a Boston hat. And I was like, no, I'm not one of you. I'm better than you. And I showed wow. him the New York hat. And then that's, he knew. Wow. All right, I know you, American. I know you're a New Yorker. That's so real. That's real true. petty in the midst of violence. I, I appreciate but here's it. an interesting thing. So they thought I was I was they thought I was Arabian, and they thought that my friend, who's who's Italian, uh, Carrie, who came with me, props to him. They thought that he was from Chechnya. And they said that they had an influx of Chechens and Arabs. And their perspective, when I talked to a guy who was a former colonel there, he said, we appreciate your contribution to our jihad. We appreciate you being here to fight off the Russians. Now go home and let us run our own country. Mm -hmm. Like that was their sentiment. It wasn't mm -hmm. they were ungrateful for all of the jihadists that came, but they said, you can't come to another country, make jihad, and then take over to take money because then you didn't come here for jihad. You came mm. here for wealth and riches. And that was what they thought originally was wrong with the Taliban structure. Many people who were opposed to the Taliban were not opposed to them simply because they had a difference of religion. They were opposed to them because they saw that they had become corrupt too. When I stopped mm. in Dubai, that was a big thing because they said, oh, well, the Taliban, you're going to Afghanistan? Well, the Taliban always used to come here during their reign. They used to party and live it up because what do elites in every society do? Which is what we're dealing with now. Whether you're on the left or the right, you have grifters and elites on both sides that are lecturing people. You open Fox News and you, you see people like Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingram complaining about other elites. You're an elite. What are you talking about, dude? You're an heiress to a, million, to a billion dollar fortune and you're talking about other people are elites? And that's the problem that bothers me. In Afghanistan, that, that raw, naked reality was on for every single person to see. Mm. And I, I thought that that was, that was incredibly interesting. And I think that, you know, when it comes to America, that's the problem. They perceive that every single person that's opposed to their, to their, to, to their regime is a Taliban. In the same way that now, you know, four years ago, Lupe, if you were opposed to Trump, people thought you were... A, 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 a neoliberal Democrat. Oh, you must support Obama and Biden. And it probably shocked people when people like you and me were like, no, I don't support that ri ridiculous regime. I don't <laughs> support a warmongering regime just because I know that this guy's a fraud. That says more about you than it does about me because you mm. can't perceive more than two sides to this miserable equation you're stuck in. Mm. And, and I guess in Afghanistan, the truth is just that much more naked. But I did see beautiful things there too, man. It wasn't all ugly stuff, man. I saw really real community. I saw people come together and lift each other up out the dirt. I saw people taking care of other people that wasn't their kids, making sure they were okay. You know, I, I saw people who genuinely cared about getting their country back together. And I also realized something that they're not developing nations. They're not third world nations. They're nations that are recovering from a war. If the mm. United States had a civil war right now, it would end up behind China, behind Russia in every aspect of science, math, military, learning, development, everything. That's what happens. And it was done on purpose in my, in my perspective. Mm. Mm. Um. 
I think some folks would be interesting when you bring up the Taliban for folks who who don't know what where the Taliban came from and what mm. how they made it. Like the Taliban's not like a, a thousand year old society of things. Like the yeah. Taliban is actually relatively new and yes. it's ex and it's actually a product, from my understanding, it's a product of the Russian kind of invasion type situation where you had these people exiling um, into Pakistan. You're right. And getting getting absorbed into into I think Jalalabad, but the 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 border kind of cities and the madrasas and all of those pieces and a dual a dual effect of like post traumatic stress like with a very very conservative very extremist practice of Islam um, promoted through places like Saudi Arabia right yes, Wahhabi right. Wahhabism and stuff like that. And what you basically had was like these kids of the war who were refugees who lost everything, right? Who got absorbed into these madrasas, which are super extreme, and painted them a very one-sided way of the world. And upon the upon the kind of the collapse of the Soviets and all these all the kind of different factions and the warlords and different peoples trying to take over over Kabul. Um, even some of those foreigners that you mentioned and stuff like that. And then also just a side note for for folks to know, and it's better, it's best for Afghanistans to speak about this. That's what I learned from Clubhouse, that, that chat, we had a bunch of Afghanistans come in, Af Afghanis come in from different parts of the world, exiles, different folks. And it's best for them to speak about it, their, their particular piece, but just for, for general purposes for our fans, I guess, right? Like when they were coming back in to kind of take similar to right now how the how the taliban is kind of going city by city province by province taking right. over get trouble you had the same experience uh when the russians kind of left right you had these different factions collapsing fighting each other people that used to factions that were fighting against the russians they once the russians were gone they started to fight amongst themselves the civil war, yeah. to take over and what you had in that was the the return basically of those kids who were exiled during the kind of Russian war coming back, right? Um, very well trained, very well disciplined, um, very charismatic, you know, very, and even to the point we talk about a lot of that corruption and a lot of stuff that was going on um, and the, the spoils of war kind of mentality, you had this group who was just like, oh, cut off the hands of thieves and hang the rapists, you know, off top. There's no trials, there's none of that other shit. And it was like a reprieve, almost a certain sense of kind of like the justice that you would kind of want in America, right? When you see some dude who's raped like nine kids, like why the fuck are we watching this dude's trial? How come he didn't get shot in the back of the police station type situation? Um, so that's what you had coming in um, and kind of taking over, you know, piece by piece, part by part. Um, but it was kind of promoted through Pakistan, promoted through Saudi Arabia, um, and just paint, and where actual, you know, like the you could you could almost call it in a in a in a way, the the true inheritors of kind of like Afghanistan would be the Taliban, right? Um, in terms of that, that they were the they were the kids who 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 got it the worst from the Russians, and then they they're returning back to claim kind of what's theirs, but in that process, Afghanistan is super diverse. It's always been super diverse. It was times when it was very liberal and you had people walking down the street in mini skirts and the whole and the whole piece right back in the sixties, mm seventies. -hmm. Um and this just the tumult and the, the fluctuation of extremist views, politics, wealth, technology, all of these, like you said, uh, Afghanistan being looked at. You know, you didn't you didn't need nickel to build laptops when they're when laptops weren't a thing. But now that laptops and iPhones and all these things are a thing, then it's your 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 place in the world changes completely, right? And and, and they got lots of tungsten there too. So there's there's a you know a, a hopefully folks get an understanding of like who the Taliban is, where they actually come from, and why they are who they are. And then part of that piece. I've been kind of I, I've been kind of following it a little bit, but part of the piece is like, you know, Afghanistan is an Islamic country, you know, and there's a lot of conservative folks on the ground, you know, who aren't Taliban. They don't come from the they they're not part of that kind of exiles returning from the madrasas type thing. They're just, but well, they're probably more hardline than the Taliban.
you know, and they're just kind of views. They just don't associate themselves politically or entitled with the Taliban because they don't come from that 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 kind of experience. So there is a somewhat some support in just the general populace from a from a presentation of like, yes, we want Sharia law. You know, we grew up in under the guise of Sharia law, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But then you also have opposition forces for political reasons. You got opposition forces, like you said, for Sufism or different kind of and there, there's also Christians and 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 different kind of Buddhist sects and different there's because it's an array of right. folks depending on what at what part of the country that you're it's in. It's a Central Asian country. It's not a Middle Eastern country. So that there's all these influences and pieces and parts. Um, and there's folks who disagree. You know, there's folks who, like you said, there's folks who were, you know, I'm an interp they're interpreters, right? Or they're work they're working not directly for the CIA, but they're being hired on as what have you, right? You still got warlords who don't give a fuck about nothing, right? They don't get it's not about religion, it's not about the politics. It's not about life. Are you gonna fuck up me getting my opium to Russia? Right? Are you gonna fuck up, like, just gonna fuck up my pipelines getting this to there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's it's, it's one of the most in summary, and I'll let you finish because you know more about this than I do. In summary, what I learned from that talk and you know, I, I I prefaced it with, you know, when I heard Obama's speech, right, the night I met him, when he was like, we got to get out of the war in Iraq and get into the real war in Afghanistan, where, again, a continuation of kind of Bush doctrine and let's go get Osama bin Laden and all that stuff. And it was like, I left, I stopped watching the speech because it was like, that's going to be a fucking disaster. You fast forward to today, where it's basically Vietnam. You know, you got, you know, they're airlifting out people from the embassy and all this other old crazy shit, which is expected. Um, but the summary of it for folks is, you know, like Afghanistan is a very diverse place. It has always been in between empires, kind of fighting. It was always kind of the battleground for empires. It was a, it was a place like almost the most proxiest proxy place that you can have in the world, right? Um, it's very resource rich. But at the same time, it's also very poor in certain in certain capacities because it's not able to execute that. And the folks who want to execute that richness, of course, want their homie and to do the, the funky Western hegemonic bullshit. But it's also a very beautiful place, which is which is you know it's a very beautiful place. That's very you know folks who just want to live a good life, you know, under their own terms. Um, and the Taliban isn't necessarily the main, the, the most optimal, in my opinion, the most optimal group to bring that to fruition for people. Because I think Sharia law, Islam, I don't think Sharia law works as a political framework, right? I think it's just way too, it's, it's way too incompatible with people's points of views and emotions. Like their, their, their actual base, like neurological points of view, like it's too incompatible to run a society politically with without doing without without converting to a bunch of corruption and bullshit and beheadings and dumb shit like that so i don't think the taliban is optimal but i don't think there's any force in afghanistan that's going to be able to stop them um and i think what's going to happen is they're going to take that shit over they're going to execute a ton of people for sure they're, they're probably doing it right now right like the all those interpreters and those well i mean are... the people the people that work with the coalition forces are definitely going to be targeted but just to, just to add to what you were saying before, because a lot of what you said is definitely true, they were incubated in Pakistan. But there's something important to note, that many of the Afghans went to Iran. And when they went to Iran, they discovered that they were only being offered like manual labor jobs. The women were many times forced into prostitution. And they felt that the reason they went to Pakistan is because they weren't being accepted by a Shia majority in Iran. Mm -hmm. So when they went to Pakistan, just to clarify for the public watching this, why they would go to Pakistan is because in Pakistan, they were given the opportunity to get education. They were, if they, if they could have a business, they were given loans by the government, right? They were allowed to be in the army. They were allowed a higher amount of advancement in Pakistani society. Um, and yeah, I, I went to Jalalabad. And that's actually in Afghanistan. And the place that they were and that little area, Waziristan, is next to um, what uh, the city in Pakistan called Peshawar. And that's where I was. And also, one more thing, just to go back and clarify for the public to know, even when the Taliban, quote unquote, held Afghanistan, 
there were portions of Afghanistan that they were not welcome in, that they were smart enough to not go to. Mm -hmm. And I went to one of those places and the place was called Nangahar. And it was called uh, the Valley of Panjshir, Panjshir Valley. And it was uh, the home of a man that someone had mentioned in the comments and asked me to speak on, um, a man called Ahmad Shah Massoud, who became famous because he was someone who defeated uh, the Russians and was not involved initially in the heroin trade. He was someone that said, this is fundamentally backward to our cause. You know what I mean? If we're gonna go backwards and become hashish assassins, like where that word comes from, he was just like, do you realize that we will become corrupted by this? This is the real haram. You think you can run a revolution with cocaine and heroin. You're going to end up destroying your people because what happens? You make a deal with drug dealers and they will make a deal with anybody. Um, so when I went to Panjshir Valley, one interesting thing I noticed was that the, the, the road there was lined with vehicles. And I'll post some pictures of this, this later so people can see. They left old Russian tanks there, blown to pieces, Lupe. And I walked in one of these tanks and I saw that the bottom had been opened and it looked like folded aluminum foil. And I was like, oh my God. And then on the top, I saw all this like black marks everywhere. And I realized, oh, that's not smoke. That's somebody's blood from way back in the day. And I had a, an epiphany in that little tank. I said to myself, this little kid, this little 20, 21 year old Russian kid that was in this tank, his mom didn't love him any less than that little white kid from Oklahoma that got blown up down there. And guess what? She didn't understand what the fuck her son was doing in that country any more than that lady waving the American flag, burying her son, wondering what the fuck was my son doing here? And I realized that the Afghans had left these trailers here. They left Taliban personnel carriers, right? They had old, like, they had an old Russian car, like, excuse me, like an old British car from, like, the war in, like, 1890 that they kept. And the, the children were using the Russian tanks and the Taliban carriers as a jungle gym, right? And I asked the OG, I was like, why do you leave these things here? And he said, it's just a reminder that you're all guests. And mm. just like a guest, you can and you will overstay your welcome. You will be asked to leave. And if you don't leave, you'll be made to leave. Mm. And that's what the reality of all people that come to this country realize. And when mm. I went there, I, I went to the grave of Shah Massoud. I spoke to his family. Um, I talked to the people there. And they reminded me that the natural terrain made Panjshir Valley inaccessible to people. In other words, you, you have one lane, one route going in, and the rest is massive uh, 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 mountain ranges. Mountain ranges, by the way, which are peppered with stations for RPGs and surface-to-air missiles. A, 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 a frontal assault is suicide. A side assault, suicide. You're getting, you're getting at least 30% of the planes blown out. So the Americans decided, okay, we're going to make a deal with these people. And I remind people that the only reason that the Americans held Afghanistan for as long as they did, or held out, is because they made deals with individual warlords to keep um, to keep parts of the nation. One story stuck out to me the most, no pun intended, and you'll get this later. So the C one, of the, one of the elders that told me that the CIA had gone to a province called Ghazni, right, Ghazni, and they had been to see one of the warlords there who controlled a small piece, obviously not one of the major guys, but he had about 5,000 troops with him. Now, for people that have been to a show and seen 5,000 people in a crowd, Dude, imagine all those people armed to the teeth and trained to kill and having experience in war. 5,000 men is nothing to scoff at, especially in a small country. They could take over a whole city if they wanted to. Mm. This brother went from one coalition and they wanted his loyalty. So they brought him weapons and they brought him this big jar of pills and shit and weapons, right? Cash, guns, everything. They leave, they come back six months later and they say to him, hey, how do you feel? How, how are things going? You know, do you want us to, you know, continue this relationship? Because we, 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 we're, we're eager to build relationships. That's what their thing was. And eager to build them. We all know that's bullshit. And the guy said, sure, but I would like another bottle. of I, I would like more bottles of those big pills. And the guy's like, really? He goes, as many as you can get. And when later on they told me that the CIA case officer 
had brought him Viagra, that the man <laughs> was 67 years old, and that he was like, he had three <laughs> wives, the youngest of which was like 19. And he, he like, this was their thing. This was their pitch. Again, we want to give you like a McDonald's, Burger King, Viagra, everything. That's what they're selling. They're selling the brand of America there. And mm. to many people, this man was considered an enemy later on because he gave into what they call, you know, like, I guess in another, I, I don't know the exact, excuse me, I missed the, the translation in, in Dadi, but it says like a, a person that was consumed by the lust, right? But lust having a double meaning, the lust for power and having been controlled by the lust that someone presented him as an option. Look what you can do. Mm -hmm. And when I then looked back at it, I saw, well, this wasn't the only, you know, stick and the carrot that they played in Kandahar, not Ghazni. Very different approach. And the men there, when I went to, uh, 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 I can't say where, but I was at one of uh, bin Laden's old hideouts, the place where the Clinton administration had fired a missile and almost hit his house. And for people say that they're not precise, let me explain some to you. When they bomb the wedding and they bomb these places and they say, oh, I'm sorry, and then we find out later that the people that they bombed are just, I don't know, it's a coincidence that they are somehow opposed to the coalition. In 1994, when they tried to kill Osama bin Laden, they not only hit the house he was in, they hit the room he was staying in, and they hit the side of the room that his bed was in. So mm. these people know how to be precise when they want to be. Mm. And what I got from them was in Kandahar, they played a very different game with the people, right? In Kandahar, what they did was they took the women from the town and old, young, whatever, they loaded them onto this big, like, giant, helicopter personnel carrier and they took them around Kandahar and then the men told me that they had the helicopter hover about two feet above the ground and they shoved all the women off like forcefully like hmm. and they told the men when they returned they said listen I understand how you all play you want to play hardball with us the next time we put your women in a helicopter we won't be two feet above the ground mm. we'll be a thousand mm. feet above the ground and what I saw was that Either you rule through fear and through subjugation, or you rule through kindness and perceived help. But both of these have the same objective. We're looking for submission, we're looking for loyalty, and we're looking for us to be the ultimate power that's here. And mm. even more so, we would like you to fight for us someday. Mm. And at the end of the day, I think that a lot of people began to see that in Afghanistan, this was a perfect place for America to be situated. You know, if you already have a deal with Pakistan, then you already have a deal with India. Now you have a deal with Afghanistan. Very, very uh, uh, important to note that the Middle East and the Baathist, the former Baathist parties, now obviously we're talking about something different, they were allied to Russia, as was the, the government of Dr. Najib and several other Central Asian republics, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, all of these. And little by little, the United States went around and started flipping these countries, right? Iraq, oh, they were involved in 9-11. No, they weren't. But we got rid of a Ba'athist and we put somebody else in. Mubarak mm -hmm. was weak, so they replaced him with, with Sisi, who is another dictator. Ben Ali, well, you know, he was faltering, so we had to put a guy in that we know. Again, back to the, our original conversation of them saying, we are going to replace the old leadership and I think what we are noticing now is that in Afghanistan, something that affected Syria is now happening there. And that's that the Russians and the Persians had a big dispute over Syria about who was going to help those people the most. And mm. the Russians kind of took over the conversation and at the very end, scooped the victory away from the Islamic Guard of, of Persia. And they said, no, 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 no. We're not going to allow you to be responsible for this. And Vladimir mm. Putin uh, actually committed regular Russian troops. See, that's what people don't realize. In, in Syria, America was using mercenaries and was using ISIS to try and overthrow Assad. Whether you like him or not, whether he's a legacy dictator, which he is, but that's not what we're going to talk about. So what happened was that the Persians felt so slighted by this situation that now they said, oh, well, now we're going to pour ourselves into the Afghan issue. Since we're 
since, since Syria is something that was so important to Russia, because unlike all those other places, that was the last thing to fall. They can't lose that. The, Israel used to be in the Russian camp. They used to have kibbutz there, and then they left. They went to the Americans. Lebanon was with the Russians. No, it, it's, it's, uh, it's allegiance is twisted from one political party to the other. And they see Afghanistan as a perfect way to break America's hand in the region. And mm. if they'll do it, that's why I think it's not just one group of people that's involved in wanting to give America uh, a, a, an embarrassing exit in Afghanistan. I think there's several countries. I mm. think obviously China is one of them. Mm. I don't know to what degree they've helped or not. That's not what we're here to conspiracy theory or philosophize. Right. We'll just say that, you know what, it's to their benefit. It's mm. to their benefit. You know, the, the, the more that America suffers in Afghanistan, it's to the benefit of Russia, it's to the benefit of China, and it's to the benefit of Iran. And it wouldn't surprise me if all of them were involved in somehow saying, well, let's get these people out at the same time. The question then comes, what are they going to do with the Taliban when they mm. do return? Are they going to say, hey, man, listen, you have to keep up appearances. You know, we can't turn this into another Iraq after ISIS where people are blowing up statues and you, you make a fool of yourself. Because then all of a sudden, what we need to show is their civilization without Britain, without America. So I, I, I'm not, as much as other people are fear mongering, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm interested about that. I'm interested in looking at what the bottom line will be because you're right, there will be assassinations and there will be what they call revenge killings. Mm -hmm. Okay, during the, the, the American coalition, you persecuted us because you had the, the white boy behind you, right? Or the puppet behind you, Obama, right? You, you got these people. Now, they're not there to protect you no more. You mm -hmm. tortured my men. You mm -hmm. killed my people. And mm -hmm. I think in Afghanistan, those politics are extremely personal. And that's mm -hmm. what I've discovered. Like the, the, the people, they, they chose jihad against the Russians not because, oh, this is what I want to do on a Sunday evening. No, they told me, man, they killed my brother. I would mm. never have people with tears in their eyes, they told me. Like, it made me want to cry when I heard this dude talk. They killed my brother. I'll never have peace with them. Fuck those Russian people, right? Mm. But then you had people that were like, yo, the Americans, they, they killed my sister and, and, and her people at the, and, and her children at a checkpoint. Like, no, I will never have peace with them. You can't get me to go sing Kumbaya with these people. I don't care who's in charge. Is it a crusty old white man named Jim Crow Joe Biden or an orange Cheeto, you know, a, a, a game show host fraud? I don't care who the figurehead is for this. You, you, you're, 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 both, you're both in such violation. And I think that when I saw kind of like this, this lifelong vendetta that they hold, um, it also alerted me to other weird things about the country. Like I asked, why do people get arranged marriages here? And the guy gave me one of the answers I wasn't expecting. He said, I've been at war with this clan since before your father was born. Since 1910, we've had problems with these people. And the only way that we made the ability for us to make peace with them is that my, my son will marry his daughter. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, he's like, and he's like, and he looked at me and he said, I don't think it's right but it's the way that we're going to make peace because I can't say words to this man he's going to believe. He can't say words to me that I'm going to believe. The only thing that we can do is share a grandchild and say, do we want to deprive that grandchild of their mm. father or their mm. mother? And I was like, oh my God, like this, this, it, it, it seems insane, Lupe, but there, there's a rational conversation to be had about even why some of the most crazy things take place in part of the world. Yeah. And, that, that happens, marriage has traditionally been some kind of unifying alliance. That that happens with the cartels now too. So you have right. cartels that kind of reach, reach like moments of like, there's no way to come back from this. It's like you'll marry my daughter, or like my son's gonna marry your daughter. Arrange like happening like now in in in, in Mexico, right? Um, for that to either consolidate power, but also create like you said, like a are you are you really gonna kill? Like you might kill your son-in-law, right? But it's like, will you kill, you know, the father of your grandson? Right. And who will your grandson want vengeance against? Exactly. You. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And your grandson will take lots of people with him when he comes of age, you know, mm -hmm. unless you want to, you know, try to kill him like Vito Corleone's family. And we all saw how that turned out for the man at the end. The son came back and he said, and that's what I think is 
what is extremely important to notice about Afghanistan too, that my perceptions of the people there and their willingness to go to war were totally changed. Like I'll give you an example. I went to Kabul University and I talked to a professor there and you know, I, please don't, don't think I'm making fun of him, but because I have nothing but respect for this man, he's a greater warrior than, I, than, than, than I'll be in this lifetime. But he was what I would call an effeminate man, you know, like a, yes, see his nails manicured, wearing everything, hair done, probably spent like more money than people ate that day on his hair, but very prim and proper. And I, I asked him not to be rude, but to be curious, right? And I, I did it in a way that did not come across facetious and condescending because that's the worst form of communication, people. And <laughs> I said to him, brother, what did you do during the, the jihad? And he looked at me and he goes, thank you for asking. That's such an interesting question. Like very softly, that's such an interesting question, he said. <laughs> um, there were, in, in the RPG groups, there are two people. There is the RPG gunner and there's the guy that carries all the shells. He has mm. to keep them in a backpack that he keeps at a certain temperature. He has a thermometer on the backpack. They cannot get this hot or the RPG will explode and everyone dies. And you can't get them so cold because it's freezing for the people that don't know Afghanistan at, at, at night. It's freezing up there. And you can't let them freeze because then it won't blow up on impact. So you have to, you have to sleep with them. Like you have to nest them at night and then you have to shield them in the shade during the day. And when the RPG firer dies, then the guy who was holding the RPGs take over. And I asked him, so what did you do? And he said, I carried RPGs until my RPG carrier died. He said, but I thank God that he spent most of the war doing it and I spent most of the war carrying them because mm. I know that his heart was heavy. Even though he committed jihad, he told me, his heart was heavy. He cried at night for the Russian people he killed. And I, I, I caution people, yo, even the, the hardest American soldier, I've seen him, bro. My brother who went to Iraq, my people that I used to train with, because people don't know I was gonna go to Marine Corps OCS. These people are broken because of what they've seen and what they've done out there. So it's not insane to imagine that they're the only people with feelings, right? Mm -hmm. No, the jihadists themselves were like conflicted saying, in the Quran, this is wrong. Like, what? I, I don't like what we're doing. We went from killing soldiers to now we kill any personnel that happens to wear a Russian uniform. This is, this is not right. What will happen to us? And then the brother told me the, the, the hardest thing for me to hear. He said, yeah, we're great people, right? Great warriors, right? I mean, almost in a sarcastic way, but he had like a tear in his eye. And he goes, great warriors. But make no mistake, the price of our freedom was this. A whole generation of scientists wiped out in the jihad. He said a whole generation of teachers wiped out in the jihad. A whole generation of, of writers, of poets that will inspire the teachers and the scientists and people to do anything in life wiped out. He said that was the price of our freedom. That was the price we paid for 950,000 Afghans to die so 18,900 Russian troops could die. Guerrilla warfare is not to succeed. It's only to make the enemy bleed. And mm -hmm. there, there's an old saying, and I think it's attributed to Kissinger or someone else, but he actually stole it. And it said, in order to win, a you know, to, in order to win, a conventional army has to win. But in order to win, the guerrilla just has to stay alive. Stay alive. And <laughs> the, the, the guerrillas have stayed alive. Mm. And the, the Americans could not win. They could not defeat them. And that was the problem. They tortured these people. They sent them to Guantanamo Bay. And their children are back to say, no, you did not kill us all. We're still here. We might not be this Taliban. But I'll tell you what, we're ready to fight. And it hurts me to see that because I really don't know what's gonna happen. Like you said, brother, there are gonna be reprisal killings. My heart hurts for that. But there also will be people who are finally gonna be let out of jail for doing nothing but questioning a regime. Now, mm. have they been radicalized in a prison in Afghanistan? Probably, right? And I think, I think it, it pains me because more and more Americans are gonna say to themselves, let's look at the history of Afghanistan. Like you said in the beginning, they offered bin Laden. 
They offered, we'll give him up. Please don't invade us. Fine, we'll give you his location. He's not here. He's in Pakistan. We'll tell you where he is. And they said, no. Mm. This is what we, we want this, 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 and this. And at the same time, the other important thing to bring up, and then I'll, 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 we, we can go back again to, to whatever. Um, I'll pass the mic, as they say, is that Shah Massoud was killed on September 10th, 2001, the day before 9-11. That always made 9-11 very suspect to me. In, mm. in terms of everyone saying, oh, that this doesn't melt at this degree and Tau Building 7 and all this other shit. Sure, we can have those conversations, brother. Some of those, some of those things have been debunked. Some of those things are still up in the air. But it, it was not a coincidence that Shah Massoud was murdered on September 10th because without him, Hamid Karzai, CIA puppet, could have never been the president of Afghanistan. And every <laughs> Afghan that's watching this and that will watch your live later on and say, wow, no, that's true. Felipe, what, 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 forget technique. I know he's real. Felipe, what Felipe and Lupe are talking about. That's true. If, if Shah Massoud was alive, Hamid Karzai could have never become the president of Afghanistan, ever. The public would not have accepted it over Shah Massoud because he spent his entire career in exile being a, a money changer. Whether a Shah Massoud stayed behind when the Russians were there, he stayed behind. When the Taliban was there, he stayed behind and said, hey, you're welcome to have Kandahar. Don't come the fuck up here to Mazar al-Sharif and don't come here to Panjshir Valley with your bullshit because I'll leave your car in the street. I'll leave you where I, literally, I'll leave you where I find you. Mm. That, uh, that, that saying should be attributed to Afghanistan because literally when I see the cars, they left them where they found them. So, I guess like for folks for folks who don't know why why immortal technique is so revered in in our space and in our world, <laughs> it's, it's not his raps his rap his raps are raps but it's because once he starts rapping and then he starts spitting this right here from his experience and his his uh commitment to certain causes but also the the intensity of his research and understanding is why we look at why we respect immortal technique above and beyond just because he said a song that had a political thing that we agree with for the moment you know or he said he had a he had a a, a verse that kind of pushed us in a, in a creative way is that once he can cut that music off and then speak to you for three hours um about a subject and and give you anecdote and nuance and fact and research and and and, and his his well-crafted and well-pointed opinion um about certain things but also has the honesty to say even with some i say even it's like we don't know what's gonna happen you know at, at the end of the day like here's all of the factors here's all the pieces here's all the parts um but at the end of the day we, we don't know exactly you can make some forecast and some prediction um and, and one kind of piece that i would you know leave people to with um and and and, and maybe tech you can speak to this a little bit as well is that you know, this is this is something for Afghanistan's. This is for something for Afghanis, right? This is a situation where, yes, support. You know, if there's a charity that you can donate to, if there 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 was one of the issues that people are worried about, you know, like oh yes, there's the political pieces, there's all these parts, there's the Americans, there's this, there's that, but there's like NGOs on the ground where their whole thing is like, yo, we need to sweep these minefields. You know what I'm saying? Like we can't even go back to oh God. farm or try and have some type of, you know, existence. Um, like we don't want to come to America. Like we don't want to exile to these places, but my village is a goddamn minefield, right? And, you know, there's there's different operations and different organizations where the solve isn't necessarily, you know, you getting all up in arms politically or you getting all up in arms religiously. But it's like, hey, man, how can you donate or help this particular move, group that's all about cleaning out all those ordinance and those unexploded RPGs and all that stuff? Right. That for, right? And that's a lot of the work that's being done in Afghanistan as well. That has nothing to do with religion, has nothing to do with your politics, nothing to do with your yeah. point, none of that. Whereas these basic operations that, that need to get funded and need to kind of get pushed so people can, so people can even get to the point where they can make a political decision. But if you're worried about, I can't walk to school because there are potentially 200 
you know, un, un, uncovered landmines from the, not only the, well, from the Russian era, whatever plan landmines, which is super fucked up. But even to your point about, you know, all of those fights, fighting the Taliban in, in, in the 90s and in different, in different spots like that. Well, yeah, there's a ton of unexploded ordinance, right? There's, there's, a, there's like a bunch of, you got those, um, when you think about the drug trade and shit like that and how it impedes us, I, you, you look at a record today to bring it, a, just to be a, a little bit of a, a hypocrite about this. But when you think about, and we mentioned the cartel early as well, when you think about these records, when you think about the songs that we listen to, when we think about the shit we're partying to, and we think about, you know, the frivolity of, of the shit that we do, that shit comes from somewhere. You know, those opiates come from somewhere. You know, those 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 overdoses and those Sackler families and all of that shit comes from somewhere. Um, and that shit, some of that shit comes from Afghanistan, right? And you think the the price that Afghanistan has to pay to allow for a situation to be so destabilized that you have a group like the Taliban being able to come in and exercise certain powers and strengths um, is due to a lot of the basic shit that we do here on the partying level, right? Like the 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 things that we kind of let entertain and the shit that we kind of let slide over here um, has these 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 second and third order, order effects in these other countries and shit like that. So some people think about gun control here, for example, right? Gun control here, like, fuck that, my second amendment, my this, my this, my this, that, and the third. And it's like, well, a majority of those guns are, aren't going to, we're not going to use them. Right. As much as we target practice and go hunting and shit, a lot of that shit's going to walk across the border. Right. Where people actually are going to use it right on other people. Right. And you're going to have 300,000 murders. Right. And you have the, the, the Mexican government suing like Smith and Wesson and shit right. like that. Right. But it's fast and furious. Just an, as an example of, you know, like, the freedoms that we have and the excesses that we have and the things that we want to enjoy, you know, there is surplus and that surplus finds its way and there's a cost to that. And it, 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 the cost is places like Afghanistan, places like Mexico, places, different parts of, of South America, di places in different parts of Asia in different, in different capacities and places in Africa in different capacities where it's a byproduct of a byproduct of us having a laptop. Right. It's a byproduct of a byproduct of a byproduct of us wanting that new car. Right. That needs that chip, which to make that chip, you need this particular resource, which, you know, the computer looks sexy, but that mine has a 12 year old in it. Right. Pulling that shit out by hand, you know. Right. So it's again to kind of think about before you get upset at the politics, before you get upset at the, the religious aspects, take a look at your life in where you are, what you do, what you're around and the things you participate in, in this first world society. And maybe give a little think to the impact that it's having somewhere down the chain or even up the chain. I think what, what also um, strikes me is that when you look at a place like Afghanistan, um, it's no secret to, to the public, but they should be reminded that after the invasion, there was a massive drop in world heroin production. But when the country was secured, not only did the heroin production go back up, but it exceeded the, 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 the original quotas that they had had for it. And one other thing that I did see with my own eyes, and I can say this is true, I saw American troops. So for people that are pro-America in, in the chat, America, best country in the world. Yeah, I, I got you. you. You happy that you got running water? and that the lights come on when you flip a switch. But I saw American troops, right? With, with the patch on their shoulder and everything and that fucking M4, they were guarding poppy fields, right? They were guarding poppy fields. Where's your honor, brother? Where's your honor? Is that honorable? That's what you went to the Marine Corps to do? To, to, to be a fucking drug dealer? Like you complain, and, and, and you got the nerve, and you got the, you got the audacity to talk about a fucking cartel. That's what I'm saying to, when, I, when I hear these Americans talk. And, 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 and rather than understand the, the, the socio-political aspect of why a cartel would exist or what would make people do that, it's the fact that people don't realize that 90 some odd percent of billionaires, like 99% of billionaires are people who have inherited wealth. The other like 1% are people who know how to monopolize a natural resource. 
which in this case is poppy or cocaine or coca leaves or whatever it may be. But you're working with those people now. And that's one thing that I will remind people that the CIA is more than willing to do. If it comes to terms with dealing with communists or anybody socialist or, or, or even a democratic republic that wants to take control of its natural resources, it doesn't matter who it is. The first people that they turn to in many of these situations are drug dealers. They say this is going to affect your bottom line. You know, we're going to legalize drugs in this country pretty soon, which is another reason why people are saying, oh, wow. So then wh where are we going to get paid from? Huh? Where are we going to get paid? And I know how they're going to get paid. You're going to have a, a booster shot every fucking six months or every year or some other crazy shit. <laughs> or they're going to say, hey, man, we're doing this or we're doing that. But that's another conversation. They, 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 they want to get paid, though, and they know how to get paid. And we can have that conversation without delving into lunacy or, 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 or conspiracy theory that's unfounded. Because I think conspiracy theory is important because that is where that's the canary in the cage for me. And when, when people get angry at conspiracy theorists, I always say, listen, they're the canary in the cage, right? And, and for people who don't know the younger folks, because, you know, I'm 43. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to lie about my age. I'm not upset about that. I'm happy. I made it a lot farther than some of y'all going to make it. But the thing I'm saying Yo, that's, is... That's fucked up. That's a fucked up. <laughs> the, I'm the saying because y'all be doing that, fucked up shit, man. Y'all still want to wild out. I'm sitting here talking about we got to stay alive. Stay yeah. alive. That's the, that's the shit. Yo, give, give them the definition of Canary Nicole, man. But I will say, before you do that, this is the other side of, of Ramona <laughs> This This is the other side of, of Felipe, right? He he can be a hard, cold asshole sometimes. Man. <laughs> <laughs> he could be a mean old man sometimes in the midst of that. But there's, that's the balance of the piece. I'm going to live some of the longer you motherfuckers. Which is, <laughs> I ain't got to say it to these motherfuckers, Tech. But, but go 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 give them the, the, the but okay so so the reason why the gas smells in your house kids is because they put CO2 in the gas that comes out of your 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 stove right and for those of you that still have like a gas stove or have gas in your house that heats the house the reason that they put CO2 is because you can't smell that gas normally right there are a lot of gases that you can't smell so if you're mining for a particular material and you hit a pocket of gas right Sometimes it'll kill the work. It used to kill the workers and people wouldn't understand how. So when they would keep the canary in the cage, if the canary died, it would be a warning, like a red flag. And they would start ringing a bell, say, oh, my God, everyone out, out now, now. In the same way, they do the same thing with radiation now and roaches. They keep a little canister full of roaches working in a radiated lab. And when the roaches start dying, they say, listen, the radiation has a chi. Obviously, they have like meters for that now but if they can detect what they used to do is put these roaches in a cage and say when the roaches start dying that's when we know that this has been affected by that and i i really do think that you know irrespective of what people think is going to happen um in afghanistan i don't think that america can wash its hands of this i don't think they can simply just walk away and say oh we tried or we did this no you didn't try you didn't do anything except keep up with appearances with this garbage. And mm. whatever that case may be, you know, I, I am not going to sit here and, 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 and give them a pass for that. They don't deserve a pass for that. Clearly, you got up, you got up from where you were sitting, and you're currently walking to the airport to go to Afghanistan, as you thought about it. <laughs> like, well, let me city. tell you something. When I'm I went get to that airport, you know, we were literally <laughs> like the only, the only quote-unquote Westerners Right. And the, oh, man, it definitely felt lonely as hell on that plane. But I'll tell you something funny. This is the funniest shit about the plane ride. When we were on the plane ride, they decided to give away money and they gave a ping pong bowl right to every single person in on the plane. Right. And we got a ping pong bowl and inside the ping pong bowl was like a number. And if you had the number, dude, they gave you the equivalent of like a hundred dollars in Afghan money. And I asked the people like, how much is this? And they were like, yo, for the average Afghan, this is like three, four weeks food. This is almost a month's food. I was like, really? And then they came in and we said, we want to make this a fair contest. So we don't want anyone to cheat. And they came through with a camera. Mind you, this is like 2009. They come with a camera. 
taking pictures of everybody in line and everybody got theirs. And they say, you can hand it back to us. And if you don't want to participate, we'll give you a free meal or you can wait and hold your card and wait until the end and then you get $100. And one of my mans was like, oh God. He was like, yo, just give me the free meal. I was like, no, nah, no, nah, I want to wait. I, I want I want to <laughs> see what this money is. And I didn't win, obviously. But it, it, it was interesting to see how they, they had changed the tactics, right? The Russians came in and they came in and they would just be like, look, we're going to take your picture. You know, da, 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 da. The Americans came in like, oh, we're going to have a contest mm. and we're going to take your picture too. Mm. And I, I'll say one thing about pictures. If you want someone to get the fuck away from your car in Afghanistan, pulling out a camera is more effective sometimes than pulling out a fucking weapon. Because mm. to discharge that weapon, you're going to get people that notice in the neighborhood and they might fuck your car up. But if you pull out a camera, they don't know who you are. And I've definitely had cars follow us in Afghanistan. And I literally pulled out the camera in the back of the vehicle and a motherfucker hit the brakes like there was someone in front. No, 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 no. You're not getting my picture. You're not mm. putting me on nobody's fucking clipboard and tagging me with a circle around me. And I saw that. And... I think, you know, for, for the people at home that don't, that don't realize that not just the privilege of having a warm house or a roof over your head, but of having a politically stable government, quasi stable government, whereas there, you know what I mean? Drones coming over your house. No, literally, there's no free airspace. If the drone want to fly over your house, you can't do anything about it, you know? And, and when you find out, brother, because this was, this was something that you should have got more credit for. This is something you should have got much more credit for. How do you call yourself a progressive president? How are you not a war criminal when 90% of the people that you killed with your drone strikes, Mr. Obama, 90% of the people turned out to be civilians. And later on, we found out that they were being targeted with metadata. In other words, it was just the phone. You don't even know who had the phone. The, the, the person could have given the phone to a relative or mm. somebody that's an offshoot of the family or he could have left it at his kid's school. You didn't give a shit. You dropped the phone on metadata. You didn't give a shit about the people. So that's mm. what breaks my heart. That's why when I look at one side or I look at the other, I say, listen, the Democratic Party is a party of bad ideas. The Republican Party is a party of no ideas. And when you look at the Democratic Party and you look at the Republican Party, one of them is run by religious fanatics that, you know, pretend to be a party of, 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 of law and order. And the other one is a party of business that pretends that they're a group of activists. And mm. that's why I think a lot of people in the Black and Latino community have become very distrustful of the Democratic Party. And in many ways, not that they agree with Republicans because they say, oh, I can't be in that camp, but where do I belong? In the same way, I'm sure there are people in Afghanistan who feel just like that mm. right now. Mm. I do not belong with the Americans. I don't want them here. But what about that huge, silent majority of people that are just like us that say, oh, I don't fuck with Democrats. I don't fuck with Republicans. But I know how each one of them affects our community differently, right? Like, you want to make Black and Latino people respect colonial borders and say, close the border and put those kids in cages and find excuses for it? You've been hoodbookered, right? They got you, they don't even have to whip you no more. You, 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 you cleaning the masses' feet without them having to whip you, right? And, 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 and not only that, but you, 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 a, you a hang around the fort Native American now, right? You, that, that's the equivalent for our people. You hanging around the fort now. That's what you do. So let's not get it twisted. There were a lot of Afghans that thought that they were gonna get away with or, or have a better life by hanging around that American fort. Mm. And now that the Americans are gone, you realize they never cared about you and they were never going to do nothing for you. Whether it was Mr. Trump, whether it was Mr. Biden, they weren't going to do anything for you, right? So when you start telling me that one is the greater of two evils, then you don't understand what evil is or you have never seen it because mm -hmm. this country, still the two of them will order lock and step for, uh, uh, for military intervention and to give Israel a blank check. Like when I hear people say, oh, well, Mr. Trump never started wars. I said, oh, really? He never sponsored that monstrosity in Yemen that mm. killed hundreds of thousands of children. He never moved the embassy 
in, 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 in Israel that caused the more repression in Gaza and gave the Israelis a blank check? You think he cares about Palestinian people's lives? That's globalism, brother. Mm. People talk about globalists. Oh, the globalists are, yeah, okay. Well, we can have that conversation. Who introduced Engels to Marx? Oh, that would be Moses Hess, the, 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 the spiritual godfather of Theodore Herzl, founder of Zionism, and actually the real proponent of Zionism, mm. which, which is important because he wrote the book Rome and Jerusalem, which was Theodore Herzl's blueprint. This is why I can't stand when these people act like they can apply American politics to something like what happens in Afghanistan, although you can see similarities in the way that the average ordinary people get sold out every day. Mm. Mm. And I, I swear to God, brother, for, for, when they were demonizing you for that, when they were, oh, how can he call Mr. Obama a terrorist? If he, if, if he had been the leader of another country, right, that America needed natural resources for, and he had drone strike people, and 90% of them had been civilians, there would be no argument against what you said. Mm. They would say, no, Mr. Wasalu is 100% correct that this man <laughs> murdered people. And, and now we're going to clean it up. And I'm going to end just by saying this. Mr. Obama made fake neoliberal shills feel like progressives. And Trump made stupid people feel smart. And we're mm. walking around in the aftermath. Mm. Mm. And, on, and, and on that note, <sighs> blackballed again. Thanks. We'll be blackballed again. <laughs> <laughs> Put all that to bed. But, you know, thank you for, for bringing up all that again so I can be two days after this nigga's birthday. Thank you, Tech. Um, hey, man. Listen, brother. Listen, you was, you, 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 history, <laughs> history will vindicate you. I will, I will say this. When History I, will vindicate you. When I said that, when I said that, um, it it wasn't, and 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 I think people people don't people have one view of us, right? As 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 public people, like public faces. No matter what we do, they have a view of us. They get introduced to us through one facet um, of either our craft or whatever, um, and you know, people don't know us deeply, right? And even 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 pe friends in the music business or friends in whatever business, um, there's still there is a learning curve, right? Where people learn more about each other over time, and sometimes it's like, no, I don't really fuck with that person. But then the other time, I'm like, yo, I really really fuck with this person outside of their music, outside of this like other shit. And I think I was kind of young in my career, and people didn't really have an understanding of who I was, right? And my points of view, um, I. You know, I I don't. I'm 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 somewhat heartless because of the streets, and so you when you witness people just get away with shit, right? Like that are your homies, right? Like yo, you got away with that shit. Like you just <laughs> fucked them people up and got away. <laughs> you, <laughs> you 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 kind of lose a sense of kind of moral, um, or preaching from the high horse, right? So I'm I'm the first to say that I'm not a saint. I'm a fucking savage. Like it's I, I'm I'm never the one to throw the rock in the glass house. And when I I say all that to say when I, met, when I said that about Obama, it wasn't out of ill will. No, right? it was it was like no. That is just that's just you're just stating an observation. Like I'm not I'm not trying to like make him not be president. I'm not trying to cancel him from whatever situation. It's just that when you look at the and I wasn't even as educated on these things back then as I as I am today. I was, you know, still a young dude. But it was like, yeah, this is the playbook, right? That is the American playbook. Like, I, the reason I stopped watching his speech, when he said the real war in Afghanistan, like, we need to get out of Iraq and get into the real war in Afghanistan. I was like, oh, it's the same shit. My expectations up to that point were that, you know, outside of progressive politics, him just being like a black man in America, right? And like... <laughs> what needs to happen as a black person in America was like, that should, even if he does 2% of what that should be, right, then he, he's good in my book, right? Because all this other shit is the American playbook. But when he specifically set that as a point and then proceeded to operate off of that point, and soon as he became president, that's when he had Israel invade Gaza. And they just started to bomb the shit crazy. 
He didn't, and I was waiting. I was like, is he going to say anything? He didn't say anything. Like for, and I was looking. I was like, is he going to make a, he didn't, he didn't make a comment about it. He didn't say shit. Maybe he was sitting waiting. And they treated to, him like garbage anyway. Uh, they treated, treated him, him like, like dog like, shit, right? And, and they were racist towards him anyway. And you sitting here trying to please people that will never see you as a human being. Yo, and you and, did everything. You gave them everything they wanted. And they still treat you like garbage. So for me, the statement was never, it didn't have malice because I was past malice, right? It was like, I'm like, we've already seen the, the, the extent of what people will do. Um, on behalf of this country, on behalf of their constituents, on behalf of their incentive packages. Like, people will do all kinds of shit. And it's not, just so, it's not just the president. It's not just Obama. It's the average dude in the street, right, will do some real, in America, that will do some real fucked up shit to you to get over, right? And, and, we'll, and we'll apologize to you. Like, I'm sorry, but I got to take your purse, old lady. Like, I'm really sorry, but I got to, I know them groceries, but I need them shits, old lady. And we're like, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling really bad about this shit. They, they don't take the shits, motherfucker. Um, so when I said it, it was never meant to be malice, right? And it was just kind of like, oh, I thought we were stating the facts. Like, I thought that's what we were still doing. Cause when we were talking about Bush, don't care about black people, which is, you know, kind of, kind of an overstatement, but I hear what you're saying. It, everybody's like, yeah, he, he don't like this. Well, don't care about black. When, when, when you, when you point those kind of like critiques or generalizations at people, you know, it was at a time where it was like, yeah, okay, yeah. But it was like, you know, y'all know Obama's not different from Bush in terms of policy. Like, you know, it's not, it, the policy does, the policy's not dictated by the president. The policy's dictated by the fucking Pentagon, mm. right? And the fucking CIA, right? Like that is the and, the, and the industrial forces behind it, which didn't change. Like, you don't vote for the CEO. Like, you don't vote for the, for the <laughs> Like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, that's who they work for. Like they don't have, they have power to execute in the law. But when you got the Koch brothers writing laws and shit, like it then it's, it's like, what, what's the, what's the point? I apologize for, for jumping down the diatribe, but it was never meant to be malice. And it was never meant to like obfuscate or, or downplay or belittle the office and shit like that. Um, but it was to just make plain, like, yeah, he's going to do a bunch of other maybe cool shit. But he's also going to do a bunch of fucked up shit because that's what presidents do, right? Like presidents come in and they have to play a game where they're going to do some real fucked up shit. And then they got another game where they're going to kiss some babies and, and build a road and do some other shit. And they're going to help their homies and show how they're helping their homies that are fucked up. But then they're not going to show you the people who are just as fucked up as their homies that they're bombing the dog shit out of. So, you know, that whole, that whole piece about like, you know, there's you know obama's a terrorist and the whole police it was like the office of being the president if you if you became the president right if i became the president right we're gonna step into the breach of continuing on some fuck shit regardless that's why i don't want to be president right that's I, why i think I people would find it unsuitable <laughs> because my first official act would be to prosecute so many people that have committed these war crimes and that have done things that way. And probably I get killed for that. Exactly. Think, That's what I'm saying. The later that day, <laughs> I the, think the White House blows up the, the, the stove in the White House for some reason. They didn't <laughs> to it gas and somebody left the stove on. <laughs> and it was birds and, and presidents dead all over the fucking White House. <laughs> and I I think I think one thing that is is detrimental to the American public's understanding of politics is just that when you take the president and you realize that they have to represent the interest of not just the nation, but of all the gigantic industries in that nation, how can they do anything else? And it reminds me for the history buffs that are gonna watch this later of the story of the emperor Lucius Septimus Severus. Now, which you, which a story which you've told me multiple times. They to, they uh, need to know my fears. Thank you. They, they 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 need the people here need to know. So for those people, uh, during the Reconquista uh, of Spain and the subsequent Crusades, uh, Europeans wiped out all of the black saints and all of the prominent black figures in the church and in Roman society in order to be you know a, a, the, 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 achieve their 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 goal of. Christianity being dominant and also the, the expanding slave trade. But well, hold, it, hold on, like, hold on, hold on. Just, just so people know, the 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 church 
removed like any trace well i won't say any trace but they started to systematically remove the appearance of black folks or things that yes. can would be considered to be kind of like indigenous or what what you would what you could just say like oh that person's not white right, right. Or that and especially during the invasion of greece which is right. where a lot of these uh, artifacts were kept because if you look at ancient greek society during probably the 9th to the 11th century 12th century ad you'll find massive amount of portraits of christ where the hue of his skin is probably somewhere between ours but closer to yours than it is to mine and very much so the hair made to a made to show that it is black hair. When you look at a picture of Lucius Septimus Severus, you realize that his father was a Roman senator from, from Rome, right? And his mother was, silly, <laughs> but uh, his mother was a Carthaginian princess, and therefore he was born into privilege. Now, this man was, so to speak, half black, half white, although I would say he was darker because the Romans were swarthy people and they were not considered white. And this is really interesting. Whiteness is invented after 1492 and in many aspects in our modern society. At that time, what they had was a person that was very dark. And having a dark-skinned emperor did not affect the nature of Rome. Rome was still Rome. It still sacked Stesphion. He sold a million men, women, and children into slavery. So what's different about this case? Simply because you have a black Caesar does not change the nature of Rome. And it reminds me of the woodcutter, the story of the woodcutter, when he goes into the forest and he's carrying an axe and the trees look at each other and say, oh, don't be afraid. The handle is one of us. And that's what I heard too many prominent so-called progressive figures saying, oh, don't be scared of Obama. The handle of the axe is one of us. Yeah, but you ain't getting the handle of the axe. You get in a whole 40 with the backwash. There you go. And you get uh, another country overthrown. And now he's, and now at, at, at his memorial party, and believe me, if people think we're being too hard on him, we could do a whole episode about, about Trump, all right? We could do a whole episode about Bush. We could do a whole episode about all of them. But we're talking about Afghanistan, and literally that, that, that war is, is firmly in the hands of Bush and Obama. Sure, Mr. Trump and Mr. Biden have caught the ass end of it, and Mr. Trump did drop a Moab on them, and the largest or the largest non-nuclear ordinance that could possibly be on them. So he's not innocent, but this war definitely belongs to those two. And mm -hmm. for them to now sit here and look back and act like they're not responsible is disgusting to me. And it also is, is bothersome that a lot of liberals, right, have allowed these people who were former Bush cronies to come on and now be part of the, the quote unquote liberal umbrella that's opposed to Mr. Trump and them. You can't wash your hands of that. And I'll go farther. I usually don't make religious claims, brother, but I will make this one for the fan base and, and for mine. The reason that they got away with that is because their victims were Muslim. Mm -hmm. if, if Bush and Mr. Obama had killed 300,000 Christian people in Iraq, it would have played differently. Brother, if I killed 300,000 Jewish people, do you think I could schmooze on late night TV and act like a fucking hero to people? This is the problem. So you can't tell me that there's not Islam. We shouldn't even call it Islamophobia. We should mm -hmm. call it no regard for people's lives if they don't fit into the exact cookie cutter image of what we want you to be. As long as you were jihadist, sure, you're acceptable. Sure, go to war for, for our enemies. Die in some miserable fucking field so that you can protect oil or, or, or some other land. But the moment you want your own country, the moment you want something of your own, well, now you're an enemy. Now you're ungrateful. Now we got to deal with you. And, and that is the disingenuousness of this country, whether it comes from a fake conservative background. Oh, we believe in God and the culture of life. You didn't believe in a culture of life when you went there and started killing people indiscriminately to cause fear, right? You didn't believe in a culture of life when you murdered Shah Massoud and you put a puppet there that would then torture and kill people, leaving a legacy of misery and death that the Taliban wants vengeance for. You can't tell those people, sure, that a lot of the things that they're going to do are wrong. We had this discussion. There are going to be mass killings. But at the same time, what are these killings for? Mm. Are, they, are they for nothing or are they in retribution? 
for torture and murder that has happened for 20 years in that country. We don't know because that's the sad part. We don't know what took place when Mr. Bush and Mr. Obama took the country over. We don't know. We don't know how many people were disappeared. We don't know how many people were tortured. And that's the heartbreaking part. And the sad part, too, is, uh, uh, Lupe, is that we seem to be some of the only fucking, not, I, I know we're not, but we seem to be some of the only people that care that that happened. Mm. Everybody else is so like, oh, man, the Taliban's coming. to and, and then you realize, well, why would the people be surrendering to the Taliban? Maybe because they're not Taliban, but the Taliban is promising to be something. For example, these people don't seem to, the Byzantines never called themselves the Byzantines, right? <laughs> people in Africa never call them. I'm from Africa. No, I didn't even say that two thousand years ago, bro. I'm Ebo. That's who the fuck I am, bro. Stupid. Now get out of here. Right. Take your stupid little metal hat with you. Like that's how they felt. <laughs> and the people from Afghanistan, you tell them they Taliban, they're like, no, I'm not. But mm. I, I, I don't want you here. Does that mm. make me Taliban? Mm. Right? Does that make me? Does that make me Al Qaeda? Because I don't want you here. You want to, if we want to have a conversation, uh, 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 obviously we can't do it now. But shit, let's have that talk. How did Al Qaeda become formed? And there's a great documentary for the people that want to watch and get a glimpse. Obviously, it's not the whole thing, but there's a little glimpse of how the 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 Al Qaeda uh, uh, society, or excuse me, the organization was formed, and it's called the Power of Nightmares. And it's an old documentary. Um, when the BBC still had some remnant of people that were willing to criticize uh, 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 the, the excess of capitalism and the idea that democracy could be the end all be all to all oppression, when in reality they were showing how democracy could easily be manipulated so that it reinforces oppression. And what it was showing was the, the, the mentality of two different people, that one had gone to the United States and the other that had come here and said, wow, Okay, I went to Afghanistan as a playboy named, you know, Osama bin Laden. I'm not really involved in anything in terms of killing and, and, and murder. The people that I keep with me, the vast majority of them were actually paid actors. That was the weird part that at first o Osama bin Laden used fake actors when his name was Tim Osman and he worked for the CIA. That was his code name, Tim Osman. Mm -hmm. And he had fake actors, but his, his first act of violence that people uh, uh, point to was that when the, they took the, the jihadists took Mazar al-Sharif, that he committed jihad against children that belonged to a group of people in Afghanistan that they call Hazara, right? The Hazara are an Asiatic people. They look more yep. Asiatic. Mm. And I say that because the Hazara literally means 1,000. And it's a little bit of a denigration so I don't want to insult the, 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 the Asiatic um, um, Muslim people of Afghanistan, but they were called that because Genghis Khan's troops were broken down into units of 1,000. And they're called Hazara because they say, oh, you're uh, a Mongol. You're, you're from that group of people. So that's why they refer to them as that. But he saw them because they were very, very uh, uh, adherent to the Sufi religion. He saw them and the jihadists saw them as a threat. So the first people that they killed were not actually Russians. They were other people from that sect. And that's the sick part when you talk about him. So, you know, Mr. Bin Laden, you're not going to hell for whatever happened on 9-11. Mm. You sold your soul way before that, mm. when you left those dead children in the mud in front of Mazar al-Sharif. Mm. That's what you, but before you sold your soul for anything else, bro, you sold your soul for that. And I think when people study the history of Afghanistan, and just like you brought up before, and, 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 and I appreciate you doing that. After the jihad, what happened, right? That's some blank part of history, like as if it was the Dark Ages. No, it was a time in which they had a civil war, and America said, huh, not our problem. Mm -hmm. Fuck you. We mm -hmm. don't have any more Russian people to give a Vietnam to, so you can go on and die. And so then what was the purpose? right, to cause destabilization in the region, that's it. It wasn't to help the people, which is why everyone is suspicious now of any involvement from Russia, China, or the United States. They realize, okay, I realize I'm going to be a pawn on this chessboard. What can I get out of being a pawn? What mm. do I get out of being white or black? What do I get out of being on this side or that side? 
And those decisions aren't made by the people, but unfortunately are made by the small ruling class of the country. What do I get? You know, because when companies go to these countries, they do not set up a free market. They set up a fucking monopoly. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's not free market capitalism. It's not what you think it is. And we don't even have that here in this country. You know, you brought it up earlier. When we talk about Illuminati, you know, if you want to see Illuminati, go to a corporate meeting at Walmart, right? Can you go to Walmart? Can you go to Kmart? Can you go mm -hmm. to the board? Can you go to the board at Kmart? Can you go to the board at, at, at Chef Boyardee and Kraft Foods and see what they put in there, right? Can you see that they use wood chips and that shit as filler instead of other proteins because it technically has protein in it, but it's what, like like 80% cheaper than it is to actually buy proteins to put it in. Sure. Like, I, I, again, please look this up for yourself. I, the, the fan base, we're not sitting here talking for our health. We're telling you that, man, this is actually happening. And this is the reason why people are suspicious of government. Because mm -hmm. if they don't care about you, you know, we're in a global pandemic. You still haven't gotten no free health care, right? You still haven't gotten health care. So mm -hmm. why would you think they want to keep you alive? They don't. They just want you to keep working in the same way that a long time ago, I'm coming into the park and I realized there's a little gate in front of the park. And it's not to keep niggas out of the park. Let's be very, very clear. It's not about that. It's so that if you go in the park and you die or you get killed or you get raped or you trip over a stone and, and hit your head and break your leg or, or, or crack your skull, you cannot sue the city. Mm. And that's all they care about, being indemnified. Right, mm -hmm. being indemnified. Oh yeah, put this mask on. We don't know what it actually does. Again, I'm not an anti-masker, please. I work with elders, so I have to wear a mask and gloves when I work with the community. I do not play games with that. I take very seriously the fact that I work with immunocompromised people. Mm -hmm. And that's something, again, I've gotten flack from idiots on my feed. They're like, oh, technique, why are you wearing a mask? And I'm like, yo, dude, you morons say all the time that this virus kills 99.3% of people. Well, I work with the point seven percent of people right that die because of this elders that are in NYCHA that are in the projects right now that have that have are recovering from diabetes that have cancer so what the fuck do you want me to do cough in their face and yell freedom shut the fuck up like stop mm -hmm. applying your stupid naive views everything has to have nuance so I, I have to I have to tell people that and for those people that say oh the consumer mask is weak that's why I have an N95 I have all kind of masks I have every mask you could fucking tech, possibly imagine. Tech, hold on, hold on, hold on, tech, hold, hold, on hold, hold up, hold up. <laughs> you want to talk about Matt? I, I got something for the freak shows. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Y'all want to play with me? This is why you, you want to play these little fucking games. bring out a gas right? mask. Watch Tech bring out a Civil War era fucking gas mask with a tank. Watch, watch, watch what he does. I'm just like, watch. He's gonna nah, make man. I told y'all. Nah, yo. Nah, <laughs> y'all want to play with me. Here we go. Here we go. Here, this is what y'all want, right? Here we go. Tech, now, I've been stop. had a mask. I had every kind of mask you could imagine. Stop. I have any kind of mask you could imagine. Since, since, hold on. My dad is a survivalist, Lupe, <laughs> like your father, right? But your father taught you how to fight with knives and guns. My dad didn't know how to do all that. My dad used to kick me out in the middle of the water and say, swim. My dad used to make me swim, taught me to hold my breath for four minutes. Listen, dude, we grew up very much the same, although I never learned ninjutsu. But I've had every kind of mask you could have gas oh, okay. mask. Look, look, you first you stopped. I got tear gas coming. when I was fourteen. Stop. <laughs> Stop reading the comments, man. You do that's the that's the trick. You <laughs> I was like, why is tech going off onto these tangents? And I was like, oh, because he's reading the fucking comments. Stop yeah. reading the comments. Secondly, secondly, folks, this is the other other side of immortal technique. <laughs> He's a fucking maniac. Like, there's, there's, there's like, <laughs> when you be like, yo, like, Mortal Tech, so like, man, he's so like articulate and, and deep and, and philosophical, but it's, he's, he's so balanced. But how come, how come he's not like teaching at like a university? Because of that shit. Because he also shows up in a goddamn, <laughs> in a bulletproof a bag. outfit, you know, throwing fucking like uh, shopping bags at people and speaking of <laughs> shopping bags at people. Uh, if y'all don't know, uh, the brother Tech does the Rebel Runs. Rebel he, Army Runs, yeah. It's yeah at, he, at Rebel Army Runs. I'll put it. I'll put it here. I'll see if I can write in the comments. At it's a it's a charity specifically for old folks and um, also for single parents. 
It was started, I just put the, the at in there. Um, it was modeled originally, my brother, after the Black Panther uh, uh, free breakfast program. But obviously, mm -hmm. because of the pandemic, they, the, they've made the laws very difficult for us to give away uh, fresh uh, food, like fruits and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. we give away non-perishables. So it's like a pound of rice, a pound of beans, um, we get a two week supply of oatmeal, canned milk. Um, we get people pasta, some kind of, um, some kind of, uh, 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 tomato sauce. And then we give them, I think it's, uh, Pedialyte for the kids. Um, we have diapers and then we have feminine products. Cause that was one thing that was going on in the hood over here that people weren't talking about Lupe. And for the ladies that are watching this, it wasn't just the toilet paper shortage that New York had. It was a, a feminine product shortage. And people were, got really fucked up. And there were people using T-shirts and stuff like that. So we went to the projects. And we got ladies, the maxi pads. And I'm ignorant. I'm stupid. I thought a woman's period lasted for seven days. And my homegirl had to hit me upside the back of my head and be like, yo, get the 12 pack of maxis for people. Okay, Mr. Coronel. And I'm like, okay, cool. So we got that and we put it out there. And now a hundred percent of that shit, we go, it goes to that. The only other shit that we do with the money is gas the car up when we load it up or that's it or pay for the parking sometimes. You know what I mean? But this is, this is the point that we're trying to make. We're, we're about to become 501c3. And I tell people during the pandemic, Hey, some people bought a mansion, right? Some people became trillionaires. I started a charity. That's what, that's what got me through it. And if I could be totally honest, it helped my mental health. It helped through the depression of being separated from my family. It helped through the sadness of my grandmother passing away, my aunt having COVID, my friend's son died of that. You know what I mean? And I said, how can I help? And I went to the supermarket one day to shop for my parents, Lupe. And I saw old white people fighting over kale, some other man punch an old lady over like milk and stuff. Like the, the supermarkets at the beginning of the pandemic were a nightmare. So I just said, no mom, no dad, tu no puedes estar acá. you guys stay outside. Let me go inside, I'll do the shopping. So now we keep an organized line in front of, I think we have four projects right now. We have the Grant houses in New York. We have Dykeman houses in, in Washington Heights. We have the Albany houses in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. And then we have um, the Isaac Center in Spanish Harlem. And we're expanding to two more places. Um, so basically what we do is we go there, we have people organized on a line. They gotta, of course, socially distance. If they don't have a mask or something, we provide uh, wh whenever we can. And we say, hey, listen, one by one, you come by and we give you your pack. And if you're our mother, or if you're an elder, because many times in our community, Lupe, see other people don't recognize, we, 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 gotta, we gotta realize the elders be taking care of the kids when the parents are at work. It's a village. It's a family. That's how we do, right? So when we do that, we realize the elders are taking care of the kids. So we included things like diapers and the Pedialyte is important now because it's a fever reducer and it, it, it is definitely something that rehydrates people. And that's what you lose a lot of water mm. when you're sick. So, you know, we're, we're not giving out hydroxychloroquine. No, we're not playing these stupid little fucking games with people. We're giving them what we know works. Stop, stop, stop. Uh, let me catch I you. didn't read that from the because, comments. I'm just telling I, people. I, I know how you are, man. But hold on. So, so Tech, we, we, we long in this. Do, do you mind if uh, we, we get a couple folks to, like, maybe ask some questions? for you or for, for us to kind of answer on whatever topic, just to get a little bit, a little bit of the audience who's been like vibing with us. Just a couple questions, if you, if you don't mind. We'll just take like, like 10 more minutes, if that's all cool. Right, all right, all right, five, 10 minutes. If y'all, if y'all got any questions, we're gonna start from now. If y'all got any questions or you wanna come into the live and maybe ask um, uh, myself or my brother Tech uh, <laughs> about anything, maybe, maybe some clarification on something that was spoken before um, we were talking about Afghanistan. We were talking about yeah. you know, all don't, 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 don't ask, let, have them ask the question. Don't bring them on because people be exposing themselves and doing all kind of reckless shit. Screaming. Right. We're going, we're going, if you got a question for, for tech, he's a brilliant person, super deep in all types of different areas. You got a question for Lupe, uh, man. He's not afraid to call out the president. Ask him. Stop, would you ask please stop bringing that shit up? My <laughs> please. Okay. <laughs> You're a hero to me, though, bro. 
You was a hero for that. You don't know. I was at home watching TV like, yeah, get him. And then you was over there like, damn, they all on me. You could have called me, son. I'd have swung in like the end of King <laughs> Arthur, like Lancelot, like the end of Excalibur. Come back, swinging the sword like, yo, yo he's right. 90% of them are, are civilians, you terrorists. Yo, night, Leo, like, people looked at me like I had seven heads after that. Like, homies, they were like, yo, so what are you talking about, Lupe? I have folks from all over the, all over the place, rappers, all kind of niggas looked at me like I was in, like I was, like I was, like I had seven heads. I was like, yo, what right. the fuck? And, and now, and now, look, and now look at them. And now look at them. And now look at them. Yeah. 90%. Hold on. Hold on. T tell them to look up the statistics. 90%. So I'm glad that the brother can do the electric slide. Right? <laughs> Congratulations, man. You... Right? I'm, glad, I'm, I'm glad the brother knows the words to Amazing Grace. Wow. All of a sudden, I'm mesmerized, as in Antoine Mesmer. Right? But at the same time, I'm not. Because I can see through something that's fake that way. Wait, wait, and I wait, bring wait, it up. Wait. I only bring it up not to bother you but to reinforce you that you did the right thing and to say that Allah put you on this path because he knew that your heart was pure about that. And he knew that you weren't being facetious and he knew that you were not taking this to be ego egomaniac and egotistical. This was not about you. This was about saying something that was wrong that you needed to point out. So if Allah knew your heart was in the right place, how can that be questioned by any man that thought you were doing this for clout? That's that's the reason I bring it up, not to cause you pain, but to make you realize the mm. worst thing that these clowns did is make you think that you did it for clout. If anything, they was being quiet for clout. They was being quiet for clout, and that's worse. You cap mm. it for clout? No, you was being quiet because you thought that was going to bring you clout. And all it brought you was death and destruction, and that was before Libya. Now go go talk to them Libyan people about that. Go talk to the, to, to the dark-skinned Libyan people and ask them how they're being treated in their own country now. Right? Ask them if they made the mistake. That's all, brother. Yo, so check it out, Tech. We're gonna take this uh brother's question, Malik Rahim. Uh he said, let's and I mean we could be concise about this. Let's talk about Cuba. I recently discovered a lot of Cubans here, and I'm assuming he's he's maybe in the States, here are anti Castro, which blew my mind. Uh was it not only the elite, but also elite sympathizers that were exiled? Um well I I, I I think, look, anytime you get a conversation about Cuba, it's going to be a lot of emotion involved. Mm. Um, mm. So let's start by saying this. In the same way that the Taliban and also the jihadists and the American forces took revenge against the people that committed violence towards them, in Cuba, not everybody that was tried by Fidel Castro and Che Guevara's government was innocent. And I hate to say that this way because I'm not condoning murder or violence, but these people, one of them, and I always remember there's a picture of a young lady and she's, I forget her name and excuse me because I would love to have this, this, this information prominent, but I didn't expect to speak on that today. But at the same time, she was holding up a sign that said free Cuba. And someone pointed out that her grandfather was the chief of police under Batista. And they said, well, of course you're mad your grandfather was killed. Your grandfather tortured thousands of people, raped women. What, what, why, why, why are they innocent, right? So, yeah, there was extreme amount of corruption in Cuba at the time of Fidel Castro's revolution. But I think one differentiation that we have to make is that there's a difference between the Cuban exile community. There are people that are opposed to Castro because they think that he went too far in the revolution. Like, for example, if you wear a Che Guevara shirt to Miami, you're going to get a lot of dirty looks. And nowadays, you might even get somebody that want to throw hands at you. Mm. But if you wear a shirt that has a man called Camilo Cienfuegos on it, you will get a totally different response. And as a matter of fact, most of the Cubans, even though Camilo Cienfuegos fought and, and died in the revolution, right, who overthrew Batista's regime, and, and he actively said he wanted a socialist government to take over. People still won't hate on him. And you know why? It's because they believe that Fidel Castro killed all of his enemies afterwards, and they think some of his enemies were more on the side of revolution. His name is Camilo Cienfuegos. So Camilo 100 fires. That's what they called him, right? Mm. So I think that there's a big differentiation. I think one thing that people forget and 
this is whether they choose to take it as a, a criticism of the Castro regime or not, is that after the revolution in 1959, that Fidel Castro uh, consolidated all the political parties, all the leftist political parties. So all these people that said that he would they would have a voice in his revolution, he said, sure, you'll have a voice in my communist party, not mm -hmm. in what you want. So he consolidated these parties and many people thought, well, wait a minute, we wanted socialism. We didn't want communism. See, the problem is that most Americans, and I hate to harp on them, but whether they're not Miami, I'm not even talking about Miami Cubans, but most Americans, they think that anything left of hunting the homeless for sport is communism because they don't know shit about politics. But here's the thing, there's a huge difference between socialism and communism. And to Americans, they're so ignorant that they don't understand that. Mm -hmm. The people who were taken out or moved out by Fidel in many ways were people that wanted socialism or democratic socialism. And the other ones were people that said, no, 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 we need communism. We're gonna be in the Russian zone. And what also affected that situation is that Che Guevara was in the Chinese camp of the Sino-Soviet dispute, whereas Fidel was in the Russian camp. For those people that don't know, communists don't get along. China and Russia had a huge Cold War themselves over the different type of leftist interpretation of Leninism versus Maoism. And I think that that is important to, to note. So when people talk about those things and they talk about Cuba, right, they have to factor in that many people that are there that are exiles now are not people who left when the revolution started. Those old white Cubans are part of what they call la sociedad de antes, which means the society of before. They really believe that Cuba was fine before, that it just needed reform, that it wasn't an apartheid state, that it wasn't a Jim Crow state, even though it was. <laughs> but the point that, th that, th that they're making is that they live in this fucking delusion, right? Whereas the younger generation says, yeah, we needed the revolution to get this dictator out, but then we replaced him with one that we didn't like, and now we have this situation now. Whereas the Cubans in Cuba that don't want Americans to infiltrate, but they don't want, uh, uh, they want less of an authoritarian regime, their perspective is slightly different. And I've actually talked to those people, and they'll say, well, here's the problem, that in Cuba, because of the embargo, it enabled Castro and that government to blame everything on the embargo rather than take responsibility for the personal failure and the failure of some of these government programs. Mm -hmm. So that, that in again becomes an issue. But at the end of the day, I still recognize that anyone calling for the violent overthrow of Cuba can't possibly care about their own Cuban people. No, you want your people to suffer. Because if you know anything about American invasion and regime change, it is like surgery with a chainsaw, okay? They're gonna come in and destabilize it, destroy it. There'll be thousands of dead people. And you know what? That'll be the people from Cuba, right? That will be them and they will fight for their freedom in the same way. And I'm gonna tell you this, because if Donald Trump was still president and China invaded, we would fight against that invasion. Mm. Why? Not because we love Mr. Trump, but because we won't tolerate someone else coming in here telling us what to do. We mm. bad enough we got these devils telling us what to do. Now I'm not gonna take a foreign master on top of another foreign master. So that is the main issue. During, during uh, 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 Mr. Bush's regime, if we had been invaded by Russia, I wouldn't have said, oh, let's fight with the Russians. No, I'd have been like, whoa, whoa, we're getting invaded. My, my land's going to be taken. My kids are going to be thrown in the cage. Look, that happened anyway. But see what I mean? It's the perception that, that even though they want to give them freedom, we know they're going to bring them freedom. You're going to bring the people of Cuba freedom? What kind of freedom? The same mm. freedom you brought to the people of Iraq? The same freedom you brought to the people of Syria? The same freedom you brought to Egypt and every other place that you've taken a huge, massive shit on? Huh. And I, I know how you're going to leave the place, right? It's not that you'll bring them fake freedom, but when you leave, you'll leave the place. Yeah. Just like Afghanistan. Mm. Bah, to bring mm. it to film. Mm. Got it. All right. One more, one more, one more, one more question, y'all. One more question. And I want to thank, shout out to everybody for donating to Adesia Nutrition. 
seven hundred thirteen dollars. That's great. That's gonna that's gonna buy a lot of uh, peanut butter packs for those little babies. Um, God bless them. The suck on. It's gonna be great. Uh, let me see. Let me see. And I, when I when I come on my lives, uh, for the most part, uh, tech, I uh, I do this little donation thing, um, just to make make the most of the time and benefit someone else. Uh, so let's do one more. Let's do one more question. Can you see the? Can you see the? Uh, the the uh, throw the question in the comment, folks. Don't throw it in the question box. Let's see. Maybe you just pick with whichever one you want to rock with. Let's see. Um. <laughs> ah, this is interesting, Tech. I think this is cool, and we could talk about a different region of the world, right? Um, tech, there's somebody in my question box, right? They say, Tech, what steps can Somalia take? Um, let me make sure I get it correct. What steps can Somalia take to have peace and unity? First off, Somalia uh, is incredibly rich in natural resources. Um, they automatically say that when you nationalize those kind of resources, that you make yourself a target for foreign invasion. But I would tell the people of Somalia, the only thing they can do is take control of those natural resources. If people need to bought out, be bought out or be thrown out, they need to create a new deal with the people that are their distributors. Because they're in the, like, if I could draw an equivalency, they're in the worst record deal possible with mm. a lot of their natural resources that are being pimped away from their country. Also, it's an incredibly important to note that the people of Somalia began these efforts at quote unquote piracy because their land was being polluted, because their waters were being fished to nothing. And also because there was massive chemical and nuclear waste dumping off what they call the Horn of Africa, which is that peninsula that extends itself from the eastern part of Africa where Somalia is located. The reason that they began uh, committing piracy is to take away the, the right for those ships to be there, to make them afraid to come and dump there. So before people demonize those people and make it seem as if, oh my God, it's a nation of criminality. There's a famous interview between, even though it's a different African country, but it applies here, between Mike Wallace and Louis Farrakhan, where they talk about the corruption in Africa and Louis Farrakhan says, no, I, can you imagine a more corrupt country? And Farrakhan says to him, yeah, I can. I'm living in one. Mm. And I'll say for people who look at Somalia or a place like Haiti, first of all, God bless those people. Um, I, I think that we have to recognize that we live in a more corrupt country. And I'm going to explain why mm. to the people that would say that's not true technique. It's because those people are so poor, right, that they'll take money from a stranger here, they're so corrupt, they won't take money from a stranger. Mm. Like, if you want to affect public policy, brother, I, I, I knew before I became a critic of Obama, I was surrounded by plenty of fake progressives, too, that were like, oh, man, I should introduce you to this person or that person, or you need to sit. And I was like, no, I don't want to, like, you're, we're not going to have a good lunch. It's going to be, I'm going to go off because this is the nature of who I am. I can't, you can't hide who you are forever. But I think I say that to say this, when you look at Somalia, the problem with the United States is that in many ways, the corruption has got to a professional level, right? Where in super PAC donations and all these things, they're not seen as corruption. Why? Because they've been given some le legitimate name in government. No, you've just legalized and you've codified corruption in this country. Whereas in places like Somalia and other countries, this is something that doesn't happen. Corruption is just rampant because people are starving. Whereas you look at here in this country, people are corrupt, not because they're starving, but because they want advancement in society. Mm. They want to move up another tier. Now, unfortunately, I got some bad news for these people. Um, your class is not based on you making $30,000 or making $300,000 right? Communists and capitalists, whether they hate each other, both have to agree on this. Class is not determined by your stupid yearly salary. It's determined by who controls the means of production. 
Therefore, you don't, if you make $400,000 and the pandemic hit and you got dropped and your fucking $800,000 house wasn't worth shit and it was owned by the bank, then you realize the hard way, right? That you did not own the means of production, mm. that you were not middle class, that you were not upper middle class, that there is working class and owner class in this mm. country, right? Mm. Working class, owner class. And in Somalia, those lines are very naked, whereas here, they're very blurred so that people feel like, oh, I'm somewhere in the middle. You know what I mean? I got a nice collar, so I'm different than you niggas. Bullshit. You in the same boat, and you lying to yourself, and you pretending like you're better than another person, but you're not, brother. Mm -hmm. We're in the same boat here. Mm -hmm. And maybe some of us have different experiences on that ship, but you're sitting here, and you're in the same chains on the same boat, dealing with the same problem. And it wasn't so much that people manufactured the, 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 the moving of the middle class out of society by draining their wealth during this pandemic. It's that they were always a paper tiger. They were always something that was an image more than a real thing. Whereas in Somalia, it became very clear that the people who were the ruling class were going to have control of the resources and were going to pimp them out to private corporations. Mm -hmm. So I would say to the people of Somalia, retake your resources. Remember, we as people undervalue ourselves all the time. So the people of Somalia, you have undervalued yourself. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? You are worth much more than their pay. Get mm. your dollar's worth, right? Mm. Build an infrastructure to the country because otherwise we'll be having the same conversation about you in 20 years after they pimped everything they can get from you. Mm. For, folks who, for folks who are interested in all of these uh, maniacal diatribes of my brother, uh, Immortal Tech right here, uh, you do it on Tuesday, right? You jump on Tuesdays and, and do a... a yeah, uh, I have a technique Tuesday. I go off there, and then we do a live on Wednesday where we go out and we show people what we're doing with the Rebel Army Runs because I think one of the things I learned about, again, bringing it back to Afghanistan, about doing the orphanage and about doing the actions in Haiti um, are that transparency is the most important thing with a charity and that people are hurt right now because they saw that the Red Cross collected what is it, three, four billion dollars in donations and ended up spending money that built like six houses and over 30%, I believe 25, 30% of those funds were used for internal costs to pay staff. Mm. Like you didn't go down there and bleed with the people. So we want to show individuals everything that we're doing. You know what I mean? And then of course, I got to say this, man, I'm, I'm, I'm working to finish the album, but you should check out Lupe's shit because he, well, you drop an album in what, like 24 hours? When is shit coming out? In an hour? Uh, I, coming I, out in an no, hour? No, no, no. That, so that's late. You're, it's latency happening right now. A few days ago, I decided to just, I wanted to challenge myself to see if I could do an album from scratch, right? So not pre, not like record an album, but like write, right. record, Put get beats, beat. choruses in 24 hours. A whole album, right? Ten songs, right? Ten tracks. And I fucking couldn't. Um, so I was like, oh, maybe I could do it in 48. And it's like, couldn't. So eventually it landed at 72. 72. Great. So I did a whole album from scratch, like from scratch, not using old verses and all shit like that, like completely. Yeah, I, I, my, my fans would, be in, would love me if I had to have your motivation. I, I do too many other things. It'd be like, technique, if you can put an album in <laughs> Yo, so, bro. If the the, 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 the <laughs> goal is to do it. So I did it in 72. I'm going to try again to do it in 24, but I'm, I'm going to wait a few months um, to try it again. But so this particular album is really, really, it's really, really great, man. It's a really, really, and I, I don't say that on some like ego shit. Like it's, I'm surprised. It was like, wow, what you can do in that, in that type of time constraint from scratch. Right. So we're going to, we're, I'm going through the process of just like, you know, you got to mix, you got to master, you got to clearance, you got to do all that shit. So we're doing all that stuff and hopefully to be out like soon. But it was, it was never meant to be released in 24 hours. It was just meant to be constructed in 24 hours. Do you have right? a title With, for the record? Huh? Do you have a title for the record? 
It's called Drill Music in Zion. Okay. I like that. I like that. <laughs> 72 hours to live. There you go. Hey. You got 72 hours to live. What would you so, do? Would you I, I, I guess we could close on this, right? Like, in any instance that you all see out there in the world, um, whether it be Somalia, Cuba, uh, New York, uh, whatever it is, whatever's happening, whatever's the headline, right? Whatever's the, the news story on the cover. Do the due diligence to just see what was happening right before, right? Because normally we don't ever get told what happened right before, like right before dude got punched, like right before that car went off the road, right before that old lady cracked a smile, like right before that dude stood up and walked off the train. Like we, we never... You never, you, you'd only really get that in court cases, right, at a discovery. And you'd be sitting there like, whoa, that motherfucker actually shot 18 people before he got punched, before he got tackled by the fucking police. So look at, the, look at what was happening or do the due diligence or ask yourself the question, like, what was happening right before Castro, right? Then you do Batista. Then you're like, oh, oh okay, I get it, right? right. What was happening, happening before the pirates in Somalia? Right. What were they doing? Right, exactly. What what was what was taking place right before that news story or that event occurred? What was happening right before, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think if you take away anything from this, no matter what the situation is, you may not be interested in geopolitics, you might not be interested in, in any of that shit. But even in just your daily comings and goings in life, what did your neighborhood look like right before you moved in? Right? What what was your city like right before? you know, uh, 1990, you know, what was the makeup of, what did your school look like right before you got into your, your high school? Like, was, was it always like this? Was it, et cetera? So just maybe take a step back, look at what was happening before. And for, in most cases that will clarify why things are happening, whether you agree with what's happening or, or not, at least why they're happening and what were some of the influences and some of the forces that drove the events that we deal with on today. So, I'm, I'm going to leave it at that, Tech. You want to close it out with something? Go ahead. See, the floor is yours. I'm going to leave people with this, gem. You don't really know somebody, right? I know some of y'all are watching this with your friends and your family. Some of you are sitting hugged up with your loved one, right? And I'm going to give you some good news, but some difficult thing to hear. And this is just the God's honest truth that I've learned in life that you don't really know somebody until they don't get what they want from you. Mm -hmm. And then you get to meet them for real. So before you say that you have friends, make sure that you have discussions and conversations with them and that you can say, okay, we can have a disagreement and that still means that we cool or that we still have similar goals even though we disagree with the process, right? Like, we all want people to be safe. We have different interpretations of what safe means, some people. Some people think that safe means putting people in harm. Some people think that democracy means giving people freedom when you can't give someone freedom. They have to be able to take it themselves. So just remember, man, whether you hugged up with somebody you love or you, you with someone else, man, you don't know that person until they don't get what they want from you and that you are worth so much more right now than you think, right? And right now, there's a lot of, there's a lot of motherfuckers hugged up with their girl getting looked at funny. That's right, honey, you're worth a lot more. <laughs> you and there's some dudes, hold on, there's some dudes. Wait, 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 let's be fair. There's some dudes <laughs> that are being taken for granted out there. Brother, you are worth much more. Do you hear me? You are worth much more. Know your worth and embrace yourself and love yourself. Because you can't love nobody else till you love yourself. And I'll go a step farther. You can't treat nobody nice and still you, until you start treating yourself nicely. Mm -hmm. You will always find excuses to accept terrible behavior and horrible abuse from people until you learn to treat yourself with love and respect. And on that note, good night. Assalamu alaikum, my key. <laughs> All right, so we going I'm gonna say this live. If y'all wanna check it out, you go check it out. Make sure you follow my brother. <laughs> check out uh, Rebel Army Runs. Thank you, brother. Uh, and uh, I'll see. You. Love you, brother. Be well. Yeah. Love you too, fam. Be in touch. Right. Peace.
Peace. Peace.